This presentation is a brief overview of the British Expedition to Egg Harbor, September 30th to October 23rd, 1778, and the affair at Egg Harbor, October 15th, 1778. It's just part of a talk that I gave virtually this year for the New Gretna Old Home Society. I called it the 2020 Pandemic Edition because it was done remotely. It was delivered for May 24th, 2020. So what is the story of the affair at Egg Harbor? I will present an overview from primarily A Nest of Rebel Pirates by Franklin Kemp and a presentation by William S. Stryker given in 1894 at the dedication of what is now known as the Pulaski Monument. These authors carefully researched contemporary materials including American accounts and British officer accounts. I also note a Stockton University publication, Sojourn, the summer 2018 edition, dedicated to the Revolutionary War here in South Jersey that has several interesting articles on this topic. The name, A Faraday Harbor, apparently was coined by Stryker in 1894. During the Revolutionary War, the Continental Congress relied on help from privateers. Sea captains could obtain a letter of mark from the Congress which allowed them to seize enemy vessels. There were many sea captains in and around Chestnut Neck who were involved in coastal trade and even smuggling who answered the call. They armed their vessels with guns including swivel guns and pursued enemy merchant vessels offshore that were largely unarmed. The British ships commonly were traveling between New York and the Delaware Bay, and the Chestnut Neck privateers found them easy prey. When captured, the vessels could be sold, put into other service, and the goods were stored in warehouses at Chestnut Neck and up the Molucca at the Forks nearby Batstow, where there was an iron foundry that made cannon, cannonballs, bullets, etc. in support of the war. The privateer captains and crew would then share in the profits, and it could be quite lucrative. Some of the goods seized were intended to support the British soldiers, and was taken to the Forks, and then taken overland to support George Washington's troops at Valley Forge while he was there. As you can imagine, the British wanted to rout out this nest of rebel pirates, and if they could reach the Batstow Ironworks, rout it, so much the better. So they planned an expedition from New York to do just that. They put Commander Henry Collins in charge aboard the sloop Zebra and Captain Patrick Ferguson in command of the troops of the expedition. There were about 12 ships of various sizes. The British left, left New York City, remember at this time they also occupied Philadelphia, on September 30th, 1778. But intelligence on the British actions of preparation reached New Jersey Governor William Livingston on September 29th. Couriers were spreading the word of an impending attack, even if unsure of the target at first. Because of bad weather and unfavorable winds, the British did not reach Little Egg Harbor for four and a half days on October 5, 1778. 
Loyalists boarded the zebra and informed Collins about the coming militia that were being mustered. Collins decided to hit Chestnut Neck as soon as possible. And on October 6, 1778, a British assault force of smaller armed vessels headed toward the shallows of Great Bay. Two grounded, the Greenwich and Granby, but they reached Chestnut Neck by 4 p.m. that day. They began a point-blank bombardment and routed the defenders. To their surprise, they were met only with small fire, not with cannon fire from the defenses. They later reported finding an embrasure that had spaces for six cannon, but there were none there at the time, and there was another works on a hill that also had no cannon. Lieutenant Colonel Elijah Clark and Major Richard Westcote had used their own money to raise a fort for defense. Franklin Kemp, in his nest of rebel pirates, places this fort right there at Chestnut Neck and calls it Fox Barrow's Fort. Contemporary records research has shown that the Fox Barrow's Fort was actually some distance from Chestnut Neck. See the map. This map labels the fort at Chestnut Neck, and it also on the center right shows Foxborough Point where the fort was actually determined to be. Now this looks landlocked, but have a look at the next map. This map I found on the West Jersey History Project site of coastal survey maps of the Jersey Shore and dates 1840 to 1841, but it shows the old inlet, and it shows that Foxborough Point was directly inside of the old inlet. So that's more like what the lay of the land was back in the 1778 time frame. So ships coming in the old inlet would go right by Foxborough Point. So it made a lot of sense to put the fort there. This little animation shows how ships would enter the old inlet and how they would proceed to reach the Mullica River. Contemporary communications indicated that there were cannon at the Foxborough Fort and that it had been manned by many men, but permission was granted to have the cannon removed to somewhere else. In October 1778, it was not defended. There is also a contemporary record of an individual who was at the fort site when the British came in, but of course he could only watch. This explains why the British didn't take any fire when they came in the old inlet. The location of the Foxborough Fort is one of the rare faults with Nest of Rebel Pirates, and some of that may be in name only, as there were two small armaments, if without cannon also, at Chestnut Neck. A question that I don't think is resolved completely is whether Clark and Westcote helped fund the armaments at Chestnut Neck or at Foxborough Point. They did get some funds paid back from the Continental Congress, but for which site is unclear, at least to me. The British found about 10 captured prize vessels at Chestnut Neck and rather than try to move them, they scuttled and torched them. Collins also decided to destroy the buildings at Chestnut Neck. All the buildings there were burned. On October 7th, Collins got further Loyalist information about Proctor closing in on them, as well as militia from the north, and of course Pulaski's Legion on the way. So Collins decided not to push to the Forks and Batstow. This slide shows the troop movements. The British were coming from New York City, Pulaski was heading from Trenton, Proctor was heading from Philadelphia, and Colonel Sam Furman was heading south toward Chestnut Neck. This slide is an estimate of troop counts from Nest of Rebel Pirates by Franklin Kemp. 
The militia at Chestnut Neck was estimated at 150, Pulaski's Legion 250, Proctor's Artillery 220, militiamen from Philadelphia 50, Colonel Sam Furman's troops at 300. This made about 970 men total. And he also mentions that 50 iron workers from Batstow organized as a state militia. He estimates the British soldier count as about 1,690 men. On October 7, 1778, the British start their withdrawal from Chestnut Neck. Ferguson saw the opportunity for raids on the North Shore, and they made two landings. They destroyed three salt works, one sawmill, and about 12 houses and buildings. One was Eli Mathis Sr.'s house. Ferguson reported no insult or injury to the inhabitants. The weather worsened, and the winds remained unfavorable. On October 8, 1778, the Pulaski Legion entered middle of the shore, known as Tuckerton now, and went down Island Road, Radio Road today. Pulaski set up headquarters at James Willits's farm, later the Nathan Andrews farm, referred to here as the Willits Andrews farmhouse. Three quarters of a mile away, he set up a picket post of about 45 men in the unoccupied farmhouse of Jeremiah Ridgeway. Now it so happened that Joseph Juliet, who deserted from the Hessian army and was serving in Pulaski's legion, he was not, not treated well there because of that, and with several men and conscripts, he deserted again and went aboard the British ship Nautilus, where he informed the British of Pulaski's position and the picket post location. Ferguson decided to mount an attack. On October 14, 1778, a message from New York dated October 10, directing Collins to immediately return to New York as the British were preparing to evacuate New, New Jersey. But bad weather continued. The British ships remained at anchor in Little Leg Harbor Bay. October 15th, about 250 men, with Juliet and two other deserters as guides, landed on Osborne Island. They surrounded the house of Richard Osborne and took his 29-year-old son, Thomas Osborne, and forced him to serve as a guide. They crossed on the wooden bridge at Big Creek. They left some men there to loosen the planks so that when they re returned, they could take them up and prevent being followed. A lone sentry at the Ridgeway Farm picket post was overpowered, and most of the men there were bayoneted to death. Pulaski, at his headquarters three-quarters of a mile away, did hear firearms, but by the time he reached the site, the British had already retreated. Thomas Osborne had slipped away as the fighting began and hid in the grass. Pulaski was unable to follow the British in any number because the bridge planks had been removed and the tide was high in Big Creek. The British only lost about two men and a few wounded, and they took about five prisoners. The Americans lost about 30 to 50, but some researchers today put that number lower. By afternoon of October 15th, Ferguson's troops were back at the fleet. He wrote in his log that since it was night, little quarter could be given. It seems more likely that this was likely that this was retaliation to a story Juliet had told him about no quarter being offered to the British in an event that perhaps was not even true. Bad winds continued. On October 20th, 1778, Collins makes an attempt to get across the bar. The zebra ground. On October 21st, he decides he must scuttle the zebra and torch it to prevent it from being taken into enemy hands. In the Nautilus log, there's an entry. 22nd October, 1778. Saw the magazines of zebra blow up. Latitude 39.43. When the rest of the ships reach deep water, Collins set sail for New York. October 23, 1778, they arrived back at New York City. The American units also withdrew. Many of the residents burned out at Chestnut Neck, relocated to Port Republic. 
So there you have the background story of the Chestnut Neck and the affair at Egg Harbor. The British expedition from New York City and back was a 23-day campaign. Some of the details of this affair may be in dispute. I tried to stick mainly to well-known generality. If I've gotten anything wrong, I apologize. There are other celebratory events, some actually annually celebrating the affair at Egg Harbor. In 2011, there was a joint anniversary celebrated by the DAR and the SAR commemorating the 100th anniversary of establishing the DAR monument at Chestnut Neck. Here is a photo that I took that day. They had reenactors and they even had live cannon firing. I was fortunate enough to catch the muzzle fire on this shot. The SAR has also placed a monument at Chestnut Neck, a bog iron monument for the privateers. The privateers and their ships are named on the plaque on the piece of bog iron. And there's also an anchor that was retrieved from the Mullica River at Chestnut Neck. This is a close-up of the plaque. This is the Pulaski Monument on Radio Road. And a close-up of its plaque. There is an affair at Egg Harbor Historical Society. George Solanus founded it and his son Michael carries on the tradition. And the executive director is Dale Denda. They hold an annual memorial service at the Pulaski Monument in October. Here are Michael Solanus and Dale Denda on October 16th 2016 at the ceremony. And two more photographs that I took that day. This is the site of the Wilt Andrews farmhouse, a photo that I took in 2010. This is where Pulaski had his headquarters. It's now on Hollybook Drive near Atlantis. My understanding is that the affair at Little Egg Harbor Historical Society owns this site and also the Pulaski Monument site, so they can't ever be future developed. This is General William S. Stryker, who gave the 1894 address at the Pulaski Monument.
This is the issue of Sojourn that I referred to that is devoted entirely to the Revolutionary War. You can obtain copies from the Stockton Bookstore and also from the gift shop at the Atlanticare Medical Center on Jim Leeds Road. You can also order it through Amazon. The bookstore and the gift shop at the hospital carry all issues.